Get your whiskey. Obviously, um, we are in the midst of a worldwide crisis with uh, Israel and Gaza's conflict. It, um, and if you've spent any time in Israel, which I've done recently, it is it's really, uh, it's an untenable situation. Um, you know, when I went in 2000, there certainly were some divisions. When Kay and I went this last January, I mean, they have wall, you know, Israel has, has, I mean, you go to Bethlehem. I was at Bethlehem on Orthodox, on Orthodox Christmas, and you're just behind, you're actually behind these massive walls that cast a shadow over you. We can never forget um, where our, we certainly, we certainly support Israel. But remember, all the Christians you know in the Holy Land are Palestinians. Don't ever forget that. All the Christians are Palestinians. Uh, they're, they're the resident Christians, and they are thinning out like crazy. Pretty soon there'll be no indigenous Christians in, uh, in Israel or the West Bank. Uh, that's the situation we had, have in front of us. Gaza is only 25 miles long, and it's five miles wide. It has 2.3 million people in it. It is one of the most. Uh, it is uh, one of the most densely populated areas, if not the most densely populated area in the world. Okay. So, yeah. You know, if you go, you have. You, you used to go to Gaza to go to Cairo. Right. I've been to Egypt before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now you have to go clear over to the Gulf of Aqaba and go down and go through Saint Catherine's Monastery, that area, which is the coldest place I've ever been in my life. Yes. Oh, yeah, you can't, you know, Gaza is a no-fly zone, Gaza is a no-delivery zone, Gaza, you know. And so, um, anyway, we are in the middle of something pretty bad. And if um, the guerrilla warfare that will take place in Gaza will be horrendous unless some type of cooler heads can prevail. Um, and uh, what we don't want is Iran to get involved which is the real, yeah, but I mean, I'm talking about, yeah, that's why we've just parked an aircraft carrier, um, you know, in, uh, right there in, in the, uh, in the, in the, the Mediterranean. Hezbollah's already involved a little bit. Yes. Yes, they are. So, you know, that's Iranian financed. And um, so, well, let us pray. Blessed Jesus, we pray this morning for the land where you walked. We pray for all those mamas and daddies and children who are terribly afraid. We pray for peace, Lord, because we're Christians. We don't believe in vengeance. We believe in reconciliation. And so we ask that you'll send great prophets there to begin to um, let um, cooler heads prevail and for... um, uh, for the loss of life to end and for uh, the fear to decrease and for people to be able to get back into their lives. Lord, um, please take care of all the, all the Israelis, take care of all the Christians and Muslims and help them, um, help them to be able to live full uh, lives before you and help these divisions cease and these, um, these uh, ferocities uh, to be seen for what they are. They're not of you. Uh, Lord, we do not see the path ahead, but you do. And so we give, we give people we don't even know into your hands and to your love. This we ask in Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, I'm going to let you in on the biggest controversy that ever took place during my seminary years. Um, it, um, <laughs> this was a controversy that, um, uh, that really rocked my seminary. And it was when you go to seminary, you keep sort of a monastic schedule. So you you have worship in the morning. You generally have worship at noon. Many times you have worship in the evening. Just depends on the day. And uh, that means you, 
you go through the Psalter pretty fast. Well, then we came to Psalm 137. And uh, I'm going to read you the first part of it, and you're going to go, oh, how sweet. Uh, and then uh, I'll take you deeper in. So Psalm 137 begins like this, and it will, you'll, it will remind you of something you've heard. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required us of songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my hand wither. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. So, the poet here is writing from where? Babylon, right? This is the poet. The poet is in Babylon, uh, part, of the ex part of the exile. And uh, what does a poet say that he or she cannot do? Come on, people. You just heard it. I mean, goodness gracious alive. You're not stumps. Uh, you, you can't sing songs of his homeland, and he can't play the harp or the lyre. He just can't do it in a foreign land. He is too... He is too distraught. Now, where have you heard those lines put to music? On the willows there. Godspell. Godspell. We hung up our harps. You know, that's... Yeah. So that, um, that's the first half of that psalm, and it's very moving, and you go, oh, yes, I know what it's like to be away from home. I know what it's like to be homesick about and, you know, not being able to, to even, even remember mom and dad or sing the songs, the hymns of my old church. You know, that's kind of where this poet is. But, remember, but after we get to verse 7, the psalm changes. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Raise it, raise it, down to its foundation, O daughter of Babylon, you devastator. Happy shall be he who re requites you with what you have done to us. Happy shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes their heads against a rock. Sounds familiar. Okay. Happy, happy will be the one that takes Babylonian babies and dashes their heads against rocks. Now that's in the Psalter. Now what do you think was the big controversy in my seminary so many years ago? What did you think? What, what, what do you think people went to the dean? There was a consortium of people who went to the dean asking to take the last part of the psalm out and not read it publicly at worship. Right? And you can see why, right? I mean, you're, you're reading along, it sounds, it sounds, you know, so beautiful and it sticks, it, it reminds us of our own human emotions and everything. But then you get, then it takes a detour, as so many psalms do, takes a bootleg and says, uh, uh, Happy will be those who take your little babies and dash their heads against a rock. What decision do you think the dean made? What decision did he make? He would not take it out. He says, We're in, you're being trained for the priesthood. You must, be, you must become accustomed with the entire Bible. Now, um, what... what positive thing does this uh, unusual psalm say about the poets of, uh, of the Psalter? What do we find in the Psalms? We certainly see encouragement. Human. You see all of human experience in the Psalter. That's why it's the most read book of the Bible. It has no competitors. The Psalter is read more than any book in the Bible uh, because people go there 
to um, enter into their full humanity and listen to the pleas that people make to God when they're at their best and when they're at their worst. The Psalter does not, is, is, is not a candy-coated uh, book of, of hymns. Uh, it is brutally true. It also is beautifully true, but it's brutally true. Um, you know, Cranmer, who fashioned our Book of Common Prayer and our way of life, you know, many people think of the prayer book is mainly a worship guide. The prayer book is really, um, it's, it's really a, it is really a guide to the way we are to live. Did you know that? So the, the prayer book is not, okay, this is what we're going to pick up on Sunday and figure out what we're going to, you know, what we're going to pray today. The prayer book was put together in 1549 as a way for people like you and me to live a life as sanctified as those in the monastery. Remember, 1549 is not that far off of the Middle Ages when the Benedictines brought learning. They were the only people that brought learning and stability to medieval communities. Cramner was enamored by uh, the Benedictines, and he wanted that, for, that type of life for every Christian. That's why the Book of Common Prayer has been put together. We are Episcopalians. We live, we pledge to live a very different kind of life than, uh, than many other traditions. We believe that our life is ordered. And so if you look at the Book of Common Prayer, it starts off with morning and evening prayer. That's not by accident. We order our life around those two polarities. We pray first thing in the morning and we pray last thing at night. It doesn't matter if you're a conservative or a liberal or someplace in between. We bookend our lives in prayer. That's what makes us distinctive. There's also noonday prayers. Many times I'll break with the grind. I'll walk into the chapel or I'll go into the veterans chapel. I'll get on my knees and in four or five minutes I can say noonday prayers with other Christians around the world. So we're ordered that way. Also, Cramner, it was very big to Cramner that we would read the whole Bible. Not just the parts we like. See, you're kind of saved from... Um, uh, on Sunday, certainly, and on Wednesdays, you're saved from preachers who just want to pick what they want to preach on. If I was to choose just what I wanted to preach on, you know, I guess we would primarily be in uh, Romans and in John, which are certainly great, uh, great documents. But the, the, the Book of Common Prayer dictates that I must preach the entire Bible to you, even the parts that, well, yucky. Uh, and so there we go. Um, but in our private readings, there are readings, there's a two-year cycle that we read through really the whole Bible if you, if you maintain, uh, you know, your uh, discipline in the Book of Common Prayer. In the daily office, we call it, is those readings are at the back of the Book of Common Prayer. And you can read how to do that. Uh, you'll read a lot of scripture. You'll go, really? Did he really want me to read this today? How much Leviticus can I take? Uh, but... Um, but you will, because that's who we are. Now, of all the books of the Bible that Cranmer um, um, extolled, the Psalter was number one. And from the very first prayer book, if you look, the only book that's printed, only, only full book that's printed in the Book of Common Prayer is the Psalter, okay? And if you look uh, on page 585 in the Book of Common Prayer, if you look closely... Uh, you look, you'll find in italics, first day, morning prayer. So, you can read Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3, Psalm 4, Psalm 5, and that's the psalms you are to read for morning prayer if you're going to read the entire Psalter every month. Then, first day, evening prayer, 6, 7, 8. And so it goes. So, Cramner from the beginning set it up so that you could read the Psalter every single month just like they do in the monastery. Um, if not, if you read the daily lectionary, you'll go through the Psalter several times. You just won't go through it every month. So 
with, uh, with that un, um, really unsettling Psalm 137 in our, in our ears, I just point out to you that uh, the, uh, the people that form, that fashioned our way of life thought the Psalter should be read through over and over again every single year. So uh, maybe that surprises you. Uh, it's what I love about our church. Uh, there's a lot of things I love about our church. Uh, all right, the wisdom books make up the most diverse collection of writings in the Bible, containing le regal hymns, rhapsodic love poems, apocalyptic visions, defiant rants, and pithy axioms. In the Jewish canon, the Tanakh, 12 books make up the writings, or kethubim. Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles, and First and Second Chronicles. Of these, Christians claim only five in our wisdom category: Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. These five disclose the consistent message of the wisdom collection that nothing in human experience can be admitted, omitted or slighted if we decide to take God seriously and, ra and respond to Him believingly. Now, how interesting that is. The wisdom collection tells us that nothing in human experience can be omitted or slighted if we decide to take God seriously and respond to Him believingly. Uh, I love that. Um, you know, so often we think that in our Christian life we have to kind of put on our best britches and we have to put on our best face and we have to lie about what's really going on with us. But that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says bring your real self before, before God. He's the one who made us. There's no use hiding from Him in the first place. Uh, so there we go. Okay, I asked first, what is the legendary basis for the wisdom books found in 1 Kings uh, 4.29 to 34? And I'll read, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and largeness of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than uh, Ethan the Ezra, Ezra, Ezraite, and Heman Kokol or Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the nations round about. He also uttered 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. He spoke of trees, from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke of also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of fish. And men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard his wisdom. So what's the legendary basis of the wisdom books found in, uh, found in, the, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures? Solomon. Solomon, of course, you know. And he's noted several times. Uh, you'll notice him in Ecclesiastes as well. Um, why would Solomon be credited with all this wisdom and being such a prolific writer? Why would he be credited? Um, God was inspired. Well, he, yes, God inspired him to be wise. Um, and why would, um, I'm trying to think, um, why is it, um, oh, um, not comforting, but um, why does it help to credit him with this if we create David with the establishing of the empire? Um, Solomon built the temple. So he built the temple where God resides. And of course, when he builds it, the God, you know, just like he did with the tabernacle, inhabits the temple. So there's that. Um, there was the, probably the largest, I mean, probably the longest period of prosperity under Solomon. Uh, he ruled with an iron hand. Uh, I don't think you would want to have been in his kingdom. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he enslaved a lot of his people to get his work done. There were less wars. There were less wars. It was a time of peace. And again, he was strong enough 
to kind of keep things together. Very much like Herod the Great who was on the throne at the time of Jesus' birth. The Romans com completely trusted him because he was so, un he was so powerful and uh, he, he delivered the goods. But when he died, his sons were unable to, well, to almost, you know, uh, uh, to chew a matzah and walk. Uh, they divided the kingdom into four, of which Herod Antipas got a piece of it, and he was pretty pitiful. I mean, uh, so were the rest of them. So, anyway, a tremendous time of prosperity. According to Eugene Peterson, the Psalms make up the magnetic center of the wisdom books, pulling every scrap and dimension of human experience into the presence of God. The Psalms are indiscriminate in their subject matter, complaint and thanks, doubt and anger, outcries of pain and outburst of joy, quiet reflection and boisterous worship. Now, as you look at the Psalter, it's important to note that the Psalter is arranged in five books, okay? Book 1 is, three to, uh, is, is uh, uh, Psalms 3 to 41, book 2 is 42 to 72, book 3, 73 to 89, and book 4, 90 to 106, and book 5, 107 to 50. What's the point of the Psalter being arranged in five books? Why would it be arranged in five books? That's what the Torah is. Very good for you. See, I'm so glad you're on the film today, Larry, so your <laughs> wife can see that, that you're, you're not just eating snacks, but you're actually, uh, you know, answering uh, in this, with this. Yeah, it, it emulates the five books of the Torah, the five books of the Torah. And like the Torah, it is uh, pretty serious. Um, now, the Psalm 1 uh, is meant to be sort of the gate, the gate of the Psalter. So I'm going to read Psalm 1. It's very short. Um, and the sense is, if you, cannot, if, you, if you cannot comply with Psalm 1, you should read no further in the Psalter. That's the, that's the sense of the rabbis. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind blows drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the in the uh, in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So how, why, so if, what is the psalm, what's the psalmist saying? Who should read on? Who's allowed to read on in the Psalter? The people who follow God and for, yeah, and what is the centerpiece of their life? What's the centerpiece of their life? The law. the law, the instruction, the Torah, okay? Now, again, let's revisit what we talk about the law. We are not talking about some rigid straitjacket. We're talking about those for whom a relationship with God is primary, that they over, they're overjoyed that God would, would uh, share His will with them through the Torah, and therefore their delight is living in that relationship with God. Those can read on. The others uh, probably just need to stop and do something else. But that's, that's the idea of Psalm 1. Um, Psalms of Lament make up the largest selection of the, 150, of the 150. Why is the writer of Psalm 142 in despair? So let's kind of look at that, 142. And I told you to look at verses 6 and 7. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of a, a prison that I may give thanks to thy name. The righteous will surround me, for thou wilt deal bountifully with me. Uh, why is the, the psalmist in despair? Persecution. Yeah, by whom? He's overwhelmed. 
He's overwhelmed by, you know, people have turned against him in some way. Yeah, I mean, he feels completely suffocated by, um, by those who are coming after him. Um, bring me out of prison. Do you think he's really in prison? Uh, where, what, what does he mean by that? By sin or yeah. Like the, trials. He has found that he's incarcerated by the trials that beset him. Um, so most of the, I mean, the greatest number of the Psalms are like this. If you are looking for a companion, when your life is, is descending, the Psalter is their place to go because there's lots of folks that can give words to your lament. Yes, Joan. My Bible has, uh, from Psalm Thematic. Yeah, this yeah. thematic thing, and it's all about deliverance. Yes, yes. Mine says 142 is written in David's name of Cain. That's right. And what is M-A-S-K-I-L? It says uh, M-A-S-K-I-L is David. Uh, as I recall, a mascal is... Um, it's a literary or musical it, term. Yeah, it's a musical term. You know, this, there's a lot in the Psalter. We don't know exactly what it is but they were pointed in a way to be sung. They were made, I mean, you know, these are all songs. These are all hymns. And so there's all this hymnody kind of, there's instructions you'll go, okay, so where does that fit in? Like when you have the term sila, uh, you know, it's a pause and of some sort. Um, I don't know if y'all know Jane, uh, Joan Ahrens, but she is a distinguished Methodist pastor, so we're lucky to have her with us. Yeah. I can tell you, this church is the finest church I've ever been in. Thank you, Patrick. I met uh, Joan because Joan was the best friends with one of your friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he gave me the privilege of doing Madeline's funeral. Yeah. Madeline was my best friend for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, great. The musician. The, the great organist that was with us, and uh, Joan took care of her until the day she died. And if you'll remember, Madeline had this terrible stroke, uh, and um, 2014, she and, died in 2019. Yep, and she could only say the same things over and over again, but she, she still it, had a beautiful smile. She still had a great smile, and she was, you know, but Joan is. She had joy out of being with you. <laughs> you were. A lot of fun, and, I, and something happened this week that was unusual. Next, next Tuesday, I'm going to Ireland. Oh wow! Oh. And when I go, I realized I had not traveled for a while, and I realized uh, yesterday, before yesterday, that Madeline owned all the power adapters, and I owned none of them. <laughs> Yeah, they travel together all the time. I mean, you know, it's wonderful to have a friendship in Christ like that, you know. And the way I got to know Joan is that although she was very busy in her Methodist churches, I mean, she served big churches, um, but she always would sing lessons and carols with us because it was important to Madeline. I mean, this year will be 24 years she's sung Lessons and Carols here. Now, we don't want somebody with a full-time job taking care of oodles of people, but she'd come here and sing. So, uh, great, great friends. Um, the Ascent Psalms are uh, Psalms 120 to 134. They were call and response liturgies that pilgrims used when making the long journey on foot to Jerusalem. Now, you know, there were three main feasts. Um, uh, what is it? Ta uh, tabernacles um, uh, and Pentecost and and Passover. That you, I think that's right. I may be wrong, but where they would make their pilgrimage 
to Jerusalem. So you were supposed to make it at least, huh? Jerusalem is up. It's always up. You're always walking up to Jerusalem. And so 120 to, uh, uh, to 134 are the ascent psalms. They are, you're going up and you're singing. Now, this is one of my favorites, and it's probably one of your favorites too, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it in labor, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up so early and go to bed so late, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Um, so they're singing call and response. Um, why would they sing 127 on the way to Jerusalem? Why would that be important? Unless the Lord builds a house, those who put all the labor into it have just worked in vain. Why do you think? I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, they're talking about the walled city and the temple. Yeah, so it's interesting. You get close. To, of course, everybody's from a village. And so you're, you know, it's very agrarian society, but Jerusalem is ma was, would be magnificent. So they're looking at all this stuff. Oh, my word, look at this. And so they could be just like Jesus' disciples. Oh, Lord, look at these big stones. Whoa. But the, the, the psalm is saying what about those big walls or about the sturdy walls you build back in Nazareth or wherever you live? What's, what's, the, what's the poet saying? Yeah, your work is in vain if what? If you don't put God first, all your work is just, is just sand. It, it, so uh, a good thing to remember as you're going to the holy city because the idea is that you go there for renewal and you go back home and say, you know what, I put an awful lot into my business. I probably need to put a lot more into my faith life. So there you go. Um, so... Any questions about the Psalter? Any questions about the Psalter? There's a lot of it. I mean, 150 of them. This is so applicable to today. Today. Yeah. There's some things going on in Israel. Okay, it say more. Pertains so much to, to everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and I put a comment in, you probably all laughed at it, but I said Hamas is really stupid because they're trying to destroy God's people. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. well, uh, I think a lot of God's people have forgotten. Yeah. What, to be a light, to be royalty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor, labor in vain. And, you know, um, we have to remember, and I've been over this with you bef uh, once before, but when Israel is delivered from, when Israel is delivered uh, from bondage in Egypt and they begin to approach Sinai, Remember, Moses is called up the mountain and he's given a pre, he's given kind of his, the kind of precursor to uh, the Ten Commandments. And the Lord says, the first thing I want you to go down and tell the people is this. <clears throat> did you not see what I did to the Egyptians? How I took you out of Egypt as if on eagles' wings. Um, and therefore... If you will keep my covenant, I will make you my most treasured possession in all the, in all, amongst all the nations because all the world is mine. And I will make you a kingdom of priests, a treasured possession. Now, this is so important. I can't emphasize this enough. Israel is not saved just to kind of run around and say, oh good, we're free, we're free. They are freed in order to be in this special relationship with God, to be a kingdom of priests, okay? Then if you read on, if you get to the fifth chapter of Revelation, as we were reading last night in, uh, in our Exodus class, um, the exact same thing is, is said. God has delivered you from the hand of Rome so that you might be a kingdom of priests. So we are Israel. Uh, we are to be a kingdom of priests. And if you forget that, you've forgotten it all. Sometimes it's called the 
Yes, that's exactly certainly what uh, they say in Saint First Peter. But I mean, it's to me, you know, of course, what does a priest do? We, I kind of said this last night during our class. A priest gives praise and thanks to God. That's our primary thing we do. Okay, a priest doesn't primarily come up with little ditties to tell people. A priest gives praise. We, we walk, think about it. We walk into church and we go, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be His kingdom now and forever. A, a priest presides, but we're all priests in there praising God. That is our primary role in life. Do you know that? It's our primary role in life to give thanksgiving and praise to God. Not secondary, primary. When we forget that, then we fall into dissolution. Because if you're not giving God your praise and thanksgiving, you're probably giving someone else your praise and thanksgiving. And so most of our life is jubilant and wonderful. Uh, but no matter how it's going, we always are priests giving praise and thanksgiving to God. Ah, but this next book makes it a little tougher. Yes, Amy. Yep, yep. But yet, you're still asking God. You still have that relationship. You see, it's it's not turning away from God, but it's asking Him, hey, I need some help. And so, even though it seems misguided to us, at least there's the asking. Yes, and these are all human responses. We've all woke, we've all been in a situation, probably in the, within the last year, when we just wanted to raise our fist at someone and say, why, why are you doing this to me? Or why are you doing this to my child or whatever? You're indignant. Um, and and um, you may even think very unchristian thoughts at that point. The thing about the Psalter is it doesn't soften any of that. It says, okay, this is part of human experience. You know, uh, this is part of it. But it's also part of human experience. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, so, all right, here's your favorite, Job. Um, Job is important to us not just because he suffered, admits Peterson, but because he suffered in ways we suffer, in some of the vital areas of family, personal health, and material things. Job is also important to us because he boldly questioned his suffering and went to the top with his questions. And uh, it's a very bad idea to candy coat Job. Uh, and I mean, in, in order to really get into Job, you got to remember it's got two, it starts off with two chapters of prose and it ends with one chapter of prose. But the meat of Job, the oldest part of Job, is the, what, what is it, 39 chapters or 38 chapters of verse of him really dealing with the agony of which, which he's, he is in. Um, so just be very careful not to turn Job into, well, you know, Job, Job suffered, but everything was okay, you know. Yeah, it's fine, you know. Job, all this stuff was taken from him, but then he believed the Lord and everything happened is good. No, no, listen, there's 38 chapters telling you how dead gum bad it is. You know, we're supposed to enter into, enter into this time of, of, um, of real uh, pathos with, with, with Job and kind of understand through him the vicissitudes of life, how sometimes we're really in a season of real pain. Um, Job may be one of the oldest documents in the entire Old Testament. We may even, the Hebrew, the rabbinic writers may have even adopted it from another source, but they liked it so much they kept it and kind of and made it part of the canon. So I don't know uh, that for sure, but it's always very interesting to me. So let's look at Job 3. We've looked at Job before, um, but um, I asked the question, how does Job express the extent of his suffering in Job 3, 1 through 19? I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to read 3, 1 to 7, and it'll give you enough. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish when I was born and the night which said a man, is con a man child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it. 
nor sh light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That, that night let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the uh, number of months. Yea, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry be heard in it. <laughs> I would say he's down. What would you say? <laughs> and he says he really wants to curse two days. Uh, what are the two days he wants no longer to be in history? The day was born and the day was conceived. I want no delight. I want no cries of ecstasy or anything on when I was conceived. I don't want anybody to say, oh, good, a man child's born. No, I don't want any of that. I want it. And so he is way, way, way down. And perhaps some of. That's it. That's Psalm 134. Uh, uh -huh, it's, not in the, it's not in Job. It's not in Job, but yes. I can't answer that. Probably it's much older than that. Probably Job is older than Psalm 134, I would guess. But I am not a textual scholar. Um, so, in fact, I'm not sure I'm a scholar at all. But, um, but let's look at uh, Job 19, 23 to 27. Job 19, 23 to 27. This is really an important, and we often, we, we, this, we read this at burials. It's part of the prayer book. By the way, 87% of the Book of Common Prayer is Scripture. 87%. You want to know why it's so lyrical and beautiful and pronounced? It's because 87% of the prayer book is, uh, is uh, the Scripture. Of course, it kind of gets us in trouble, too. When I was a brand, when I was got out of the military, I was serving a church very much like this one uh, in the, just on the edge of the city in Birmingham, Alabama. It was called St. Mary's on the Highlands. And uh, I, was, uh, I was offering to teach a Bible study to the women. And I had one of these dignified, the lady I really liked, come into my office. She goes, she goes now pay it. I have never, I have never needed the Bible. The prayer book's been enough for me. <laughs> that was also the place, I also, I, in that church I did all the financial work. I was in charge of all the maintenance. I was in charge of all the hunger ministry, which was pronounced because U.S. Steel had just pulled out of Birmingham. And I was a youth pastor. I don't know how I did all that. But um, I was a lot, lot younger. <laughs> And um, I never. I had a very young wife, um, and she was working at University Hospital, and she was pregnant. So yeah, that was an interesting time. And we had just we had just uh, um, taken over guardianship of this boy who uh, who lived with us um, from Texas, and so it was a busy time. But I had. <laughs> I said the vestry would give me the salary, so I would, you know, I would know the salaries of all of our employees in advance. Well, I was, so I was, I was trying to get the new salaries put into the budget, and in comes the rector's wife. I'll never forget her, man. She was like a whirlwind. She walks in, she goes, "Now tell me how much we're being paid." <laughs> And I said, uh, ma'am, last time I checked, it was your husband that was on the payroll, not you. <laughs> that did not go over very well either. <laughs> now, a more solemn part of that job, um, it, was a, a, it was really a beautiful church. But, you know, what happened when the wheels come off your commerce, when a major industry ends in a city, I cannot tell you about the despair because in Birmingham, we have, a, we have a sort of a mountain in between those who have and those who have not. Or that's not really fair. We have on the one side of the mountain, Red Mountain, we have those who run the industry. On the other side, we have those who work in industry. That's really how it was set up. Well, on the, where all the St. Mary's people actually, you know, where they lived, they were, they were, they were doing fine. Their, 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 their households were just fine. They were, they were bought out by U.S. Steel and all those things. But on the other side, the worker bees, they just flat lost their jobs. Thousands of them. Thousands. And so I would have, 
we'd have hunger. We'd have these big old men, proud men, come to the door and say, uh, and, they were, and, his, and their whole family would be living in their car. Like three children, four children. I mean, and so he'd come to the door and the rector would come to me and says, now, Pat, you just throw a dollar bill out the door. Just open up the door and throw a dollar bill out. And I said, um, I'll never forget, he was, a, he was Mr. William Asga. And I said, uh, I'm not going to do that. And he goes, I, of course, I just got, I mean, I was just got out of the military. I said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and he says, well, I, what are you going to do? I said, well, we, we're the church. We got to do something. You don't just throw a dollar bill at the dead gum door. And, um, and so uh, he said, I don't care what you do. Just... Just set up something. Well, we had so many special accounts. I set up a way to deal, to help the hungry uh, with not even touching the operational budget. And we set up something, certainly not as elaborate as we have here, but I don't know if you can remember. Just, just throw a dollar bill out. I mean, really, crack the door. <laughs> I'm thinking, who in the hell ordained him? You know, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was another another time. Um, I went to him. I can't remember. He said something really coarse, and I went to him and I said, uh, "I said, and this is in private." I said, "Mr. Asger, um, I don't think what you said is appropriate." And uh, he says, "How dare you question me?" And I, I said, "I said, well, I think I can question anybody." He says, "He get, he stood up. He got stood behind his chair, and he says, I am the rector.'" <laughs> I wanted to say you're the rectum is what I want. <laughs> you know. I <laughs> now you can see, yeah. <laughs> now you can see why the Bishop of Alabama would not place me in a parish. I mean, you know, <laughs> I never have, I mean, I, I have never understood this idea of two different sets of rules and stuff. Yeah, yeah, he was a great guy. Yeah, those were fun days. Then I came to Texas, you know. Then I came to Texas. Um, yeah. All right, enough of my crazy stories. Um, you, but you don't have that much longer to hear them. Um, okay, on nine, uh, chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. And this is Job speaking. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and a lead and lead they were given into the into the rock, graven, carved into the rock forever. For I know my redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, then from, then from my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold him, and not as a stranger, for my heart faints within me. Um, What is, what is Job's great desire here in chapter 19? He's been, now remember, he's been grilled by his three friends. Um, Bildad, Zophar, and there's one other. I mean, if you've got, you got a friend named Zophar, you've got problems anyway. But, uh, but um, uh, he's got three friends, and at first they're real sweet to him. They sit shiva with him at first. They sit with him for seven days, but after that, they come after him. I mean, they come after him and say, you, you've got to be unrighteous. There's no way God would do all this to you. So finally, Job throws up his hands and he says, I know I'm, I'm going to die, but I would like this to happen first. What does he ask for, Thyra? What's he want? Now, he wants to see God eventually, but what else? He wants his words remembered. He wants what he's been saying to these ne'er-do-well friends uh, to be remembered, oh, that they were written with an iron pen. They were chiseled into rock, basically, what he's asking. I want it chiseled into rock so no one will ever f forget what I have said. And he says, I know that there's a redeemer that lives that will take up my cause. Now, here, uh, we always attribute that to our Lord, um, which is fine. But the real word here in the Hebrew is goal which means a kinsman who will claim you, a kinsman who will take up your cause. Now, Job has no one to take up his cause, but he says he knows as a redeemer, there's a kinsman who will take up his cause and, and defender 
as in Ruth. Oh, Lord, Larry, I hope your wife, please, Mary, and I hope you're looking at this. The man has come through with a great connection. The only other place I can remember that Hebrew word is used is in Ruth. And who becomes Ruth's defender? Boaz. Boaz. That's when Boaz, uh, I can't remember exactly what he does, but he throws a, a blanket over her shoulders, whatever. It's symbolic that he is going to become her defender. And he's going to become her kinsman defender. And, of course, he becomes her husband. But... Um, that's after that rather spicy night, but uh, that's another, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, Naomi, believe me, there's always a mother in law behind everything, you know. <laughs> I love that book. Now, you just, you're going to see Boaz tonight? Yes. Well, listen, try to get a secret place off to the side, you know. I'm going, Lord, have mercy. Uh, put on your perfume. Put on, yeah, right, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's where you see Goel. So I know that my Redeemer lives. And so we take that. That's the reason why we march down. When we're mar if you come to Episcopal burial, which you'll have plenty of chances to do that here, uh, when we're burying someone, we say the anthems. We, and our, our anthems primarily come from Romans and from Job. And so we're marching down, and, and uh, burial in the Episcopal church, it's only right where the priest lead the body in. So usually we're behind, right? We're behind the procession. But... Even if we have a choir, the priest must go first. Now, if we have a cross, it goes before we do. But so often, you know, just it's a priest, and uh, and we start off with um, uh, the lines from from John: "I am the resurrection and the life," saith the Lord. He who believeth in me, yet though he die, yet shall he live. Uh, and he who liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then the next lines, though, come right from here. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and at the last day He will stand upon the earth, whom my eye shall see, and whom my eye shall behold, who is my friend and not a stranger. Now, how, how interesting that we choose that passage from Job uh, to express our hope. Why do we do that? Why do you think we choose, we lift this from Job in the anthems? We're receiving this person into that into yeah. the presence of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And we believe that, uh, that 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 person's Goel, that person's Redeemer, is standing there and will and will uh, will take up for them. And our Redeemer, of course, is Christ, and He will He is the one who ushers us into the presence of God forever. All right. I am doing nothing but preaching today. Nothing. Um, we want an advocate as much as we want a savior. We want someone to understand us, don't we? You know, I just want someone to understand. And I, I wrote down this scripture. I know you know this one from Hebrews. Um, uh, Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Without sin. We... I love that scripture. You know, we don't, Hebrews is an interesting book. It's more like an extended sermon. But um, uh, here we get the very human Jesus depicted by the writer of Hebrews. You know, listen, we don't have a Savior who doesn't know what, it, what it's like to be human. He is human. He's fully human. He knows what it feels like, and He knows our failings. Um, this morning I was writing a letter to all of you, all of you who, uh, you know, I have written you 46 letters in the statement, in the financial statements. 46 letters. So number 46 came, I wrote it this morning starting at 4.30 in the morning. And um, I said, one thing we have to remember is when Jesus says, I am the, tr the way, the truth, and the life. When he says, I'm the truth, he is saying, I'm the truth about God. I am, the son of I am the son of God. If you want to know what God is like, you have to look at me. So he is definitely saying that. I'm telling you the truth about God. And so, you know, in Jesus, we see the fullness of God. Not a part of God. We see the fullness of God. But also in Jesus, we see, we see the truth about human beings. He is the son of man. And that's what he preferred to call himself. And we see... Um, uh, we, 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 we see what the complete woman or man is to look like. 
in Jesus. He shows us. We can't, we can't forget that part of it. We can't forget the part that Jesus calls us to emulate Him, to emulate the Son of Man. That's the, that's the trek we're on. Okay. Ecclesiastes is Greek for the preacher, or better still, the teacher. In his acerbic, plain-speaking way, the teacher makes it clear that we cannot create a life of meaning on our own. Okay. Ecclesiastes. Um, I ask who is the supposed author of, uh, of this strange book and how is his honesty disturbing? And I ask you to look at Ecclesiastes 1, 1, 1 and 12 to 15. Yeah, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. I, and then I go down to verse 12, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my mind to seek and to search out wisdom, all my wisdom, all that's done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the sons of men to be busy with. I have seen everything that's done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. Or as we often say, it's a chasing after the wind. So, <laughs> um, Ecclesiastes, uh, you, you, uh, it is not one of my more, in, it's not one of the more inspiring books. It's, it's a little, it's so honest, you know. Here's Solomon coming to the end of his life and he's saying, you know, um, he's almost saying, why even try? You know, <laughs> it's all chasing against the wind. Um, and I ask, what is a teacher's recipe for happiness in this life and, uh, and why is found in Ecclesiastes 3, uh, 12 to 15. Okay. Um, I know that there's nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Also, that it is God's gift to man that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God has made it so in order that men should fear before Him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. So God knows everything is going to happen. It's been set in its course. And what's His recipe for being happy? He drink and be merry today. Now, there's some real gospel wisdom in that. Have you ever tried to base your life on the future? Yeah. Why didn't it work? Why did it not work? I'm not supposed to know the future. Yeah. Well, also, well, thank, I mean, you know, the future, the future has not, never gets here. I mean, if I think of the number of times... You know, I'm going, you know, just wait till this happens. You know, just wait till this job opening comes open or just wait till whatever. It's a terrible thing because the future never gets here. Yeah, and uh, I love to talk about the grass is not greener on the other side. And so the grass looks greener on that side. And I'm on this side. What happens when I climb over the fence and get on that side? I'm on this grass now. It looks just as bad as it is back here. I mean, so the grass is not greener in the future, you know. So uh, also, what happens if, if you are, uh, you are uh, enamored by the past? If you're... You can be stuck. You can... Uh, it, of course, the past is already gone. And therefore, you're living in nostalgia and so forth. So the preacher here, Solomon, whoever wrote it, is saying... Live in the present. Make the best use of the present. Don't put off your life. Don't put it off. Live it fully now. I think that's why everything has its own time. Yeah. I think that's why he starts out in that section about everything. There's a time for everything. There is a time for everything. Exactly. Kay and I were walking early this Well, it wasn't that early that morning because you slept in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I had been up since, you know, before Jesus got up. And, um, uh, and so we got up and went on our walk. And she started talking about what our schedule was like when our children were little. And she started saying, 
Kay, Pat, you remember I'd get off, I get out, get out of the hospital at at uh, ten thirty or eleven. 11.30, I'd come home, I'd sleep, I'd have to get, we'd, I'd get the kids up to take them to school, and I'd go to school, and, and I'd, then I'd get ready to do it all over again. I said, we were younger then. <laughs> but that's why Kay always says, there's a good reason the Lord gives children to the young. <laughs> I mean, can you, I mean, if you look back and you start thinking about, how did I keep up that schedule, my Lord? I mean, it's just, you know. Uh, of course, I, bared, I bore most of the burden of raising our children, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm going to, Marion, he's acting up, so please. Okay, Proverbs, like most of lit wisdom literature, is concerned with how we live our lives on earth now and not with how we get to heaven later. True wisdom comes not from books and degrees, but from committing ourselves to family, being faithful in our personal relationships, and eschewing greed in our work life. Many have said that Proverbs was written for rabbinical students. Why would preachers need these short quips of wisdom? So there's a, really a fairly strong number of scholars that believe that Proverbs was written for, for students in the... Uh, ra, uh, what do they say, the rabbinate, uh, but preparing to be preachers. Why would, why would preachers need these short quips of wisdom? Sticks in your mind. Yeah, easy to memorize. Sticks in your mind. Um, what's that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're always being asked for, you know, for some bit of wisdom. Of course, less and less people come to me for wisdom. I don't know what that says, but, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, it would be, uh, it would also be a guard that you don't, you don't step in, you know, you don't make some silly, some silly moves as a preacher. Um, so, uh, I told you to look at Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. Let's see what goody I have there. 3, 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your, all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This is probably the primary instruction of the writer of Proverbs. What is it? What's his primary instruction? Trust in the Lord. Rely not on your understanding. When's the last time you got into a big train wreck because you relied on your great understanding? You know? Yeah, like yesterday, right? Um, it is really a temptation um, to get ahead of the Lord, I think. Don't you? I mean, there's some real wisdom on waiting on the Lord <laughs> and let him, let him guide us. When I've stepped out ahead of the Lord, it is always bad. Not sometimes bad, always bad. So that's the, that's the main thing the, uh, the writer of Proverbs is trying to tell us. Um, the real authority for our lives is outside of us, not inside of us. Uh, now, it's inside of us if you, you know, you've been given the Holy Spirit, but still it comes from the outside. We are people directed by a power beyond ourselves. That's why I like people in recovery so much. I realize that, I know that only a power outside of myself could make me well. What the true words have never been said, <laughs> ever. A, only a power outside of ourselves can make us well. Um, so uh, that's what he's saying. And some people really love the Proverbs. There's a lot of you read, read them often. Um, yeah. You like them, Sally? Yeah. Um, okay, here's, goodness gracious, I've come to the end. I may end up early today. Y'all can go, you know, rather than just having a two martini lunch today, you can have a three martini lunch. <laughs> Um, so, so <laughs> if I had a three martini lunch, someone would have to take me out of the restaurant kind of in a comatose state. <laughs> I'd be happy, but I'd be, <laughs> but, um, okay. Again, where would you sleep? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. If nothing more, the Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs, let us know, lets us know that the Bible was not written or edited by a bunch of prudes. <laughs> 
When God created woman and man for each other in Genesis, he started a fire that burns hot. So I'm asking, and uh, what's going on in Song of Solomon 5, 2 through 6? Uh, man, this is good. Huh. Hope you brought a fan. Uh, I slept, but my heart was awake. Hark, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? Why bother? I bathed my feet. I could, how could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch. My heart was thrilled within. I rose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh upon the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. You know, it's like waking up and saying, can I get that dream back? My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called, but he gave no answer. Woohoo! Lord have mercy. Love to love you, baby. Okay, uh, is that on film too? <laughs> uh, what's going on there? What's going on there? Lovers are seeking each other. So either they're actually seeking one another or one of them's having a great dream. Until the end, I'm here. Where are you? <laughs> I mean... I love the Song of Solomon, because, really, uh, and I wrote those lines, but about it. Not, people think the Bible is an uptight bunch of 66 books. They're out of their mind. The Bible lets it all hang out, baby. I mean, there's, I mean the Song of Solomon is about as racy as anything you could read. I mean, I picked a tame portion here. But um, so it... Um, it tells us that God marvelously created man and woman to, uh, to be, have this electricity, this magnetism between them. It draws them together. If that was not the case, folks, we wouldn't be sitting here. You know? We wouldn't be sitting here. That um, we would not exist. I mean, but don't tell me. I tell you, God is a really good engineer, you know? You know, I, I often say this at weddings, but... And Genesis, um, when, um, you know, <laughs> I love this, Adam says, uh, uh, God, I, I, I'm lonely, you know, I, I'm lonely. He says, don't worry, Adam, I'm going to let you name the animals. Okay, giraffe, monkey, hippopotamus, cockroach, you know, and Adam, you know, Adam goes and says, you know, I, that's great, thank you, but it's, that's just not working for me. <laughs> And so the Lord puts Adam into a deep sleep and, you know, and he takes a portion of his body and he makes, he makes someone who's like him, but just enough unlike him. Okay. And of course the scripture reads, here at last is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, right? That doesn't, you know, there's flesh in my flesh, bone of my bone. You know, no. My Hebrew professor, I had a great Hebrew professor. He said, you know, we really don't know how to translate that. It's more like this. Oh, yeah, that's what I wanted. That's the one I wanted. <laughs> and uh, I just love that, you know. Um, I also like watching my Hebrew professor try to jump up and down. But, um, but I mean, th there is this this wonderful ecstatic attraction that man has for woman and woman for man. And praise God for it. Praise God for it. Um, now, the, the church fathers, and if you read the church fathers, and I would recommend it, just be ready. They take a lot of license. The early, in the early centuries, the first commentators on the Bible took a lot of license with with the scripture they love to they love to take it further and further they just they saw all sorts of of implications they, they yeah they embellished it for people's understanding and so um if you're interested in those kind of things i think amy our librarian has a lot of church father stuff in the library but um uh don't ask her for the song of solomon she's kept all those for herself but uh, uh but uh <laughs> um, who, do the, who do you think the church fathers, as the church fathers was trying to deal with the Song of Solomon, what did they begin to think this attraction of man and woman was, uh, in, the, in the book was a metaphor of? What was it, what was it 
what was it describing? God seeking man, man seeking God. Yeah, God, uh, uh, this, this seeking of, of, of us for the Lord. And that the Song of Solomon tells us, according to the church fathers, our relationship with God is much more like a romance than a contract. Now, I believe that. I believe that. I believe our relationship with, with, with the Lord is much more like a romance than it is a contractual, transition, you know, transactional thing. Um, because after all, what would it mean to be in a relationship with God if it was just, you know, you uphold your part of the bargain and I'll do my part? I mean, it's nothing like that. It's more like this. Yes. I'm taking up. I am. Uh, I'm taking up a, a a special fund today to see if I can pay Maggie to go someone spe someplace special. Uh, <laughs> no, I. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, listen, I would agree with you. The, the, the great improvement, the second, the second edition of humanity, uh, was much better than the first, as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I'm coming to the conclusion. I'm ready for women. To, to run the nations of the world because I'm, I, I just don't think we have to be fighting all the time, you know? Uh, so anyway, any, any questions about the writings? I hope you've enjoyed. This is a very, this is a part. Yes, Allie? I do have a question. Uh-huh. Excuse me because I have a new Episcopalian. What do you mean by the church fathers? I mean uh, people like uh, Tertullian, Origen, Augustine, uh, Cyprian, all these these all of these um, these um, men primarily, who uh, wrote about the scriptures in the first centuries, the first to about the sixth century. So, um, you know, when the scripture was very new, they began to read it and they wrote voluminously about it. I think Augustine wrote five million words. Augustine is later than most of those people, yeah. Uh, so, but just, that's what I mean by the church fathers. And it's before there are any denominations or anything. These are just dudes that were writing. Some wrote exhaustively about all the scripture like Origen. Um, but uh, St. Jerome, of course, translated the scripture, uh, both from the Hebrew. He wrote the Old Testament. He translated the Hebrew uh, into the Latin, and he wrote... Uh, he wrote the Greek into the Latin, and of course, the name of his Bible is what? Vulgate. The Vulgate. Thank you. The, the, the scripture in the, ter in the vulgar tongue, in the tongue of the people, which ended up standing uh, until the Reformation as the only scripture. So, any other questions? Thank you, Allie. That was a good question. Yeah. No more questions from Maggie because you know where, where we're headed, you know. You know. Um, Okay, next week we're going to study the epistles. We're moving into the New Testament, uh, into an area that you're much more familiar with. But aren't you happy you've studied these areas that you weren't familiar with? And so we're going to study the epistles next week. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, you'll have a lot of opinions. And uh, so, okay. Make sure you get your study sheet. Do not claim you don't have your homework.